Hello, everyone. <laughs> and thanks for, for coming to PDX iOS. Um, uh, if you've been looking at the agenda here, we've been mingling. Um, so I think we got a small enough group we can run through and do introductions if we want. Um, and then I've got a few things to, to go over. And then, um, and then we'll have uh, Chris will tell us some tips and tricks for App Store success. Um, and big thanks to Criticism and uh, Chris and Mark for bringing us pizza and beer. It's great. Um, so here's a few things I wanted to, to go over. Um, there's two things on the first one. Um, we now have a code of conduct. It's basically um, a clone of the uh, Stumptown syndicates. Um, the gist is don't be a jerk. Um, and if anybody is a jerk to you, let me know. And uh, if you want to see the uh, all the the finer details of that code of conduct, um, we now also have a PDX iOS GitHub org, and it uh, the code of conduct resides in the policies repo there. So if you want to read that over, that'd be good because uh, by by hanging out here, you um, implicitly accept. So. <laughs> But like I said, it's basically just don't be a jerk. And I don't. Uh, don't. Um, so yeah. Um, and another thing about uh, for me to not be a jerk, I waited till the last minute to um, to schedule this month's meetup, which basically meant I slid in right underneath the uh, uh, Coco Heads meetup, which is tomorrow. So I wanted to plug them. They're, they're meeting up tomorrow um, with Scott Neal talking about core data. And um, it's at Walmart Labs, not too far from here. You should go. Um, and How does it feel to go there? Can I just show up and they let me in? Yeah, yeah, you just show up. Um, they're, they're above the Rock Bottom Brewery. Um, so you just head there. And they, I don't, I don't think they have a meetup page yet. Um, but I, I think Janine is doing that here soon. Um, but they're on Calligator, so if you go look for it on Calligator, um, that will have the exact, exactly what you're supposed to do. But basically, I think you show up between 6 and 6.30, and the doors down there are open, and somebody will be there to take you up the elevator. Um, and they have pizza and, uh, and drinks every night, or every meetup, which is also nice. And I believe the criticism guys are bringing desserts for them. That's what I heard. Yeah. yeah. So yes, I highly recommend people go out two nights in a row uh, for iOS talks and go see that. Um, and also on that note, I want to start making these um, these more regular. And um, so. I'm picking right right now. I'm picking the second Wednesday of every month is what I when I think I'm going to be doing that, unless there's any immediate. No, that won't work. Um, so my same time. yeah, same time, six thirty. I think works pretty well. Um, we used to for there's there's a few of you that have been here for some of the older ones. We used to meet up at another place across the river, and I'd like to reach out to them and and start getting them to host again so that we meet up on the other side of the river every once in a while um, is, a, is another thing. Um, it's really easy for us to meet here for me, um, being the organizer and also working here. Uh, but I want to, to not uh, exclude any, anybody who it's hard for you to get downtown at 6.30 on a weekday, because I know that can be a problem. Um, so other than that, um, I, don't have a, I don't have a speaker scheduled yet and that's only two weeks away so um, either either I need an idea to for me to write a talk and I will give one or um, I was also thinking about um, doing another Swift workshop that was pretty popular last time we did it and I think now that people have had some time to play with Swift another workshop might might be fun um, maybe even a, a more guided fashion um, so so those are 
Those are my thoughts on that. Anybody, anybody have anything you want to throw at me for, for that? <laughs> good, good, good. Yeah, so I'm thinking that's most likely what will be, what will happen in two weeks. I think it's like the 12th or something like that. Um, so yeah, look forward to that. Um, so other than that, we can do introductions. I'm Ryan Arana. I guess I should have started out with that. But um, I do iOS here at uh, Esri, and we work on geo tools um, for mobile developers. Um, and on a more personal fun note, anything video game related, I'm into. So. All right, I'll step in before uh, Chris does and um, just mention one more thing uh, that we will also head to Bailey's usually um, if there's enough interest for beers afterward. Um, so hang out for that if you'd like. Um, and so other than that, here's Chris. So this is me. I'm Chris Beauchamp. I'm an evangelist at a company called Criticism. I live and work out of San Francisco. That's where our base office is. I'm here with Mark Filipovich. You can call him Flip. We all do. He might just be too nice to correct us, but he's the he's our guy, our, our manager here in Portland, so he's your local rep. Uh, once I kind of shoot off to the next town, he's definitely the guy to answer any questions you might have about criticism. So a little bit about myself. Uh, I've only been working in criticism a few months now. I've been an independent developer for six, seven years, whenever the iPhone came out. I was one of the first apps in the App Store. Uh, I started writing when I was in college, just for fun. I was originally building widgets. If you guys remember those desktop things that were on, on Mac, I built a YouTube widget that got over a million downloads. And I was so psyched. It was my first like coding experience ever. And it kind of got me hooked into getting into the consumer app development market. So of course, as soon as the iPhone came out, I jumped on it and started learning Objective-C and all this kind of stuff. Uh, that was when I was in college. I started civil engineering, and app development kind of got me hooked. Ended up in computer science and built a few apps when I was in college. Uh, one of those apps got built by or got bought by a company in California. That company then got bought by a company in Japan. So I went back to kind of building apps for a little while. I built one. We raised some funding and got about 30 million downloads or so. And so we raised funding. I spun it out, and now it's its own little 10-person company out in San Fran. And I was looking for kind of my next venture, what I want to do next. And still build apps on the side for a company called Whitewater Labs. It's basically just me and a designer, uh, but just kind of fun little side projects. Um, and when I was looking for what I wanted to do, I wanted to work for a company that I really enjoyed their product. And Criticism, I had been <laughs> using them in my apps for four or five years now. So I figured they were a pretty good opportunity. So now I run around the country and talk about Criticism. But to you guys, I want to start with talking about some of the tips and tricks I've used over the years to kind of gain that success in the App Store and build these really solid apps that people all over the world love. You guys probably have heard of some before. You probably have better ideas of your own. But hopefully, you can take some of these, these concepts and, and walk away with something that you learn. So this is obviously not a very formal setting. If you guys have any questions, comments, hate mail, you want to start throwing stuff at me during the presentation. Happy to happy to catch some beer bottles up here, so just let me know at any time. So you guys, we went around the room. That was pretty cool to hear what everybody's background was, what you guys are working on. Um, a lot of guys just getting started out, just putting apps in the app store, getting ready to. If you're anything like me, you're pretty confident that it's going to be the best idea ever. You're going to make $10 billion, be the next Snapchat or Instagram, and life is going to be good. But unfortunately, Whatever you're working on, there's probably already something out there that does something extremely similar. So you need to figure out, OK, you don't want to throw it all away. Because if you look at something like Instagram, they weren't the first photo sharing service, right? I mean, they were the 8,000th photo sharing service. But there was something about the user experience, something about the way that they went about things that really took off and kind of caught hold with users. So don't just throw your idea away because there's already something out there like it. Look at how you can approach it from a different angle and maybe capture the market in a different way. 
So one of the things I want to talk about is how can you really stand out from all those other apps that are doing similar things? The first thing that comes to mind is SEO. You know, if you come from the website, SEO is a very common term, search engine optimization. And the web kind of translated into the app side in terms of like Google to iTunes or uh, Google Play, but it's not one-to-one. -one. There's certain things that you need to do differently in, in the iTunes store than you would on Google to optimize for search engines. This is one of the apps that I built a few years ago that, that raised funding and all that good stuff. It was called KeepSafe. And if you notice, the title of the app is not called KeepSafe. It's called Hide Photos with KeepSafe, a private photo vault to lock your pictures. And if you think about what that does, it's got photos, photo, and pictures all in there, all in the title, jammed in, all the keywords we could think of. And we noticed such a big increase just by changing the title because our brand carried no weight, especially in the beginning. We needed to do everything that we could to boost that discoverability and get noticed by more users when they type in, I want to hide pictures into, Google, into iTunes. So we, there's brand recognition in there, but we don't lead with the brand recognition, right? And that, that gave a, us a lot of traction in the App Store just by making that minor tweak. Apple's starting to crack down on that a little bit. Uh, but I still get away with a lot. So test the limits and see what you can, you can really do. Same thing with keywords. Um, on iTunes Connect, you can only change the keywords at every version release. So they make it a little harder for you to game the system. But every time you release a new version, try putting in different keywords and seeing how that affects your ranking and how it affects your search results in the App Store. Always be tweaking, always be seeing what can help you and kind of benefit your SEO. One thing I'm still very proud of, 516 five-star rating. Yeah. It only got bigger and bigger as time went on. You can tell it's an old screenshot because I've got iOS 6, that black bar at the top. So the underlying theme for the rest of the talk is going to be ratings. I'm very proud of all my apps because they did very well with ratings, but it's also been a key to the success, I think. And if you look at this chart, it, it might take you a second to kind of digest it all, but these are the rankings here, so the average top rank of an app, and this is just over time. So the blue line is a lowly rated app, so like one to two stars. Uh, green line is medium rating, maybe three to four, and then the red line is high rating. So this company, Fixu, they track kind of, they track the app store over time. And what they noticed here in July is that there was a marked increase in app store rank for apps with higher ratings. So what everybody inferred from this is that all of a sudden Apple turned the switch on in their search engine that said, OK, now we're going to factor in ratings into the search engine results and into the optimization. So one thing that you as users at least have seen, if you don't use it in your own apps, is one of these rate us screens. OK, so this is the kind of the standard uh, rate us. We're glad you're using our app. Hope you enjoy it. But take a look at the difference between these two. Right, so this one says, rate us five stars in the title. And at KeepSafe, we tried this. We had this one originally, and we tried this one. And we noticed a difference literally overnight in our rating system. There's something psychological in users that they see that, and they're compelled to give you a five-star rating, not a four-star, not a three-star. I can't explain it. I'm not going to try to, but it worked for us. So it's something worth trying, I think, for you guys as well. One other thing I've seen, uh, this is a third screen, by the way, I did switch slides. So this, this button right, right here, uh, I've seen this in a couple apps, similar variations, but it says, no, I hate you and your puppy. There's something about users that they really don't want to click that button, because they don't hate you, they don't hate your puppy. So yeah, I guess I'll go ahead and rate it now. I mean, even little things like that, we are always playing around with it, and it, honestly, they give results, so why not? Another thing I actually heard from, uh, uh, from another developer is that they prefer to kind of prompt them first to say, to ask them, do you love our app? If they do love our app, then we'll show them one of these screens. If they don't love our app, it says it could be better, then it'll kick them over to like a support form. So then they'll go and instead of giving you a one star rating on the app store telling you I hate your app, they're gonna go right to a support form and have an open email with the developer to let them know what they're looking for, what they don't like. So I, I haven't used this myself, but I've heard good things. So one service I want to point out is this company called App Figures. 
Uh, I've been using them for a long, long time. And they basically aggregate all your ratings and rankings and sales and all this into one simple website. And they actually send me a daily digest every day to see how are my ratings doing today, how are my sales doing, all this kind of stuff. Uh, but it allows you to track your ratings over time in each individual country. So you can see how are all these changes, how are all these optimizations working out in the real world? You know, it's not just my gut anymore. I'm able to look at real results and, and aggregate them very nicely and very quickly. They also show you uh, ranking. So across every different country, they'll show if you're in the top 25, the top 100, whatever. And you can see how your rank is affected by different events that you might be pushing out in your app, uh, which is, again, it's just a useful little tool that you can glance at every now and again. So you don't have to go in iTunes and scroll down to the bottom and click the flag, then change to the Ecuador iTunes store, and then scroll through and find your app to see where you're rated in Ecuador. Just aggregates them all very nicely. So one thing I noticed in, my, in one of my finance apps, uh, we did very, very well in Brazil for some reason, and I couldn't understand why, but I saw that we were in the top 10 or top five in Brazil for finance. And this, this service kind of pointed it out to me. So what we ended up doing is localizing it. We converted, localization is just translation of your app. So we took the core app and sent all of our strings files to Tetris and they kicked us back Portuguese files and we dropped them in and now we had a Brazilian native app. And that really, really helped us in a lot of different countries. It worked out so well in Brazil that we expanded and did it in all kinds of different countries, which unfortunately can kind of come back and bite you because you end up getting support requests that look like this. And me as an independent developer, me and my buddy that lives in Rhode Island, we are not equipped to handle 10 support requests from Chinese people every day. We just can't do it. So being able to localize and being able to expand to all those new markets is great, but just make sure that you kind of reel it in a little bit. You don't get too over anxious and just do every language on the planet because there are some downfalls to it. You want to make sure you can handle the support and handle the feedback that you end up getting. All right, so these are things that, that I kind of do across all my apps, and you know they're pretty generic tools that you can use to, to kind of increase your SEO, increase your optimization, things like that. But what about your personal app, right? Every, every app is different. You need to do different things and, and try out different stuff. As I mentioned, <laughs> we're getting some love going on here, but. So I, I went to school as a civil engineer, and obviously I'm a hardcore iOS guy, this is what I do. I don't know anything about design. I'm starting to learn a little bit, but you'll start to realize very, very quickly once you publish an app that people don't give, a, give two cents about how great your algorithms are in the back end. If it works, great. But what they do care about is how nice it looks and how good it feels as they're using it. And this is everything from the icon to the first screenshot that they see in the iTunes store. That's their first touch point with your app. And I don't care how good your code is, if that touch point looks like crap, nobody's going to download it. So this was very hard for me to understand for a long time as an engineer. But we need to work very closely with designers. and and really kind of put that to the forefront. One thing to make sure, don't let them get their egos too big because it's not everything. And if you work with designers, you'll notice that they'll just send you like Photoshop files or Illustrator files and they're static files. They don't think about what happens when I click this button down here. Is there a transition up? How do all the fades look? How do the, f how do the screens kind of switch in and out? You need to make sure that your designer is held in check for stuff like that because they won't think about it. They'll just see it as flat screens. And if you only do that, you're only doing 50% of the work. So really think about how all the interactions feel once the app is out there. Do you guys like all of my little critters floating around here? Any, anybody noticing the critters? No? <laughs> One of our co-founders, she's a designer. So she has a lot of fun with these little guys. And I got a whole bag of them, so make sure you don't walk away with without a critter, because I can't fly back to California with all those things. <laughs> so another thing that you just kind of have to do as a developer, or, or we notice has worked very well for us, is anticipate user pain. And what I mean by that is we're a development shop of two. I'm the only developer, and I've got a designer. There's only so many things we can tackle. So we know that we're not going to be able to get every feature in there. We're not going to be able to make everybody happy. 
So how you handle that when you know you're not gonna make everybody happy is really where you start to make a good app great. So you'll notice this is my finance app here and it lists just a long list of currencies. We knew we couldn't support every single currency, so we envisioned this use case of a user downloading our app and opening it up. They're scrolling through, they're looking for the currency, they can't find it. They get to the very bottom and they're angry, right? They wanna go into the app store, they wanna give you a one star review because they hate you now because you didn't put in their currency. So we put this little button at the bottom that just says request another currency. And that does a couple of things, right? So it, it keeps them out of the app store, which is first and foremost. Uh, it pops open the support page that says, hey, tell us which currency you would like. So it keeps them out of the app store, it keeps them in your control, and it also gives you a direct outlet. So they can say, I want the Iranian real or something like that. You might not have known that as a developer before, but if you can pop that into the next version, you just converted that user from giving you a one star review in the app store to making them really happy when they download that next version. And chances are they're gonna go back and give you a five star rating and be a happy user of your app. Because you went and you made that effort to show that, hey, we really care about our users. You reached out and we responded. You know, Users feel good when they see stuff like that. Especially since there are so many apps out there that just kind of neglect their users. Support's always at a minimum. You need to think about how, how your users are actually gonna feel when they try to reach out to you. So this is something that we've seen work very, very well for us. And I use a service called User Voice for that. Uh, it's a nice feedback service. So it's a SDK that you pop in and like two lines of code. Uh, so it, when you click this button, it just says User Voice, open up a support page. And it'll open up a feedback form for the users to kind of check out. You're gonna have a very vocal subset of users. So there might be, depending on the size of your app, there might be 10, 100, 1,000 different users that are very, very vocal and say, I want this, I want that, I want another thing. But if you've got a user base of 10 million people, you don't want to dictate where your app is going just based on those very vocal users. So I always use an analytics service. I don't care which one you use. I use Flurry. They're very, very good and been around a while. Uh, and they give you all kinds of good information. Uh, this is kind of their core info page here. It'll just show all the sessions that are occurring. It's a nice way to see how many people are using your app, where are they using your app, um, and more importantly, which features are they using. So this is a list of different events that are taking place and views that are being shown. And you can sort by how many occurrences are, are happening of this, right? So that, that way you can see, uh, you can scroll down to the bottom of the list and say, oh, th these are things that people aren't really using. Would it be a big deal if I just chopped this out? Or maybe they're using this a lot more than I anticipated. Maybe I need to build that out a little bit more. So it's a good way to, to sort all the different events and all the views to see what people are actually using in your app. So one other thing that they just added is user retention. Uh, and as a developer that's trying to make money, I've noticed that user retention is far and away the most important thing that you can focus on as a developer. Because those users that stick around the longer they stick around, the more likely they are to pay you. It's pretty simple. And if you want to hear numbers for that, one of my favorite anecdotes is from Evernote. The CEO came out and he said, we pulled together 11,000 of our first users. And the first month that we tracked them, they were paying us $700 a month across these 11,000 users. He said two years later, those same 11,000 users were paying them $11,000 a month. So you think about that, over, th over the course of two years, just because Evernote was able to grab onto these users and keep them stuck in their service, the users are adding incremental value every single day that they use Evernote, right? So the more value that the user adds, the more pain it's gonna cause them if they try to jump out of Evernote. So if you can get to the point where it's more painful to leave than it is to pay you, then you're gonna be a happy developer, I guarantee it. So focus on user retention and really keep this as a top metric not just how many downloads do I have or how many users do I have. Really look at how many users are coming back a week, a month, a year later. <coughs> so these are the two, uh, two of the bigger ones, both free. Uh, you know, like I said, Mixpanel is another good option. Localytics is out there as well. But there's something that's, there's, you can go deeper here, right? And that's what we're working on at Criticism and I'm gonna wrap up with, with a few things about what we're working on over there, and I'll tell you, we've heard a lot of people that say, well, I'm using Flurry already, or I'm using Google Analytics already. So Flurry got bought by Yahoo, 
and Yahoo is one of our customers. Google Analytics, the founder of Google Analytics, he sat on our board for a while, and he introduced us to Google Ventures, who is now one of our investors at Criticism. So these guys recognize that there's still a need for something a little bit deeper than just user analytics, because you can track what a user is doing, but you also want to track what is the device doing, how is the performance working in your app. And that's what we're working on at Criticism. So we're just an SDK for app performance. We're on all the big platforms, iOS, Android, Unity, uh, Accelerator, PhoneGap, Windows, HTML5, you name it, we're probably on it. So what does it mean by app performance? I think about these scenarios. What happens when your deployed app, so you, your app is out there to all the users, what happens when it starts breaking? Or it runs slowly or poorly, drops a connection, or at worst, crashes? You're really left in the dark unless the user says something. And back when I first started in the early days of the App Store, I would see something like this. It's a one-star rating that says the app is crashing. And me as a developer, I don't know what the heck to do with this. How do I debug this? How do I figure out what was causing the crash? Like The best thing I could figure out is I might social engineer, try to figure out who this person is on Twitter, and then maybe reach out to them. But best case scenario, I was getting a conversation with the user like, hey, what happened when your app crashed? Users don't have any idea what to say. They're going to say, I don't know, my phone probably just sucks. Well, that doesn't really help me as a developer. So that's kind of how Criticism was born. And it's been around about four or five years. And we're used by some pretty big dudes, actually. Uh, we're on over a billion different devices. I guarantee you we're probably on most of your phones here in one way or another. And on over 20,000 different apps. Some of these you've probably heard of. So Groupon is one of our big customers. and to tell you how important monitoring performance is, they do over $350,000 in revenue an hour. Think about that. And over half of that revenue is derived from mobile. So how much effort, how much time, how many resources do you think they're dumping into mobile? They need to make sure this is working. It's got 99.99999% uptime. Otherwise, they're losing thousands and thousands of dollars an hour. So you think about the business side of this, and it really all starts to click together. So the product at the core, we were crash reporting. When it first came out, uh, just kind of aggregating stack traces, allowing developers to see what's going wrong in the app without having to go out and reach out to the user. So it was all very passive happening in the background. You can. This is just a list of all my crashes in my app. And you can do things like sort by how many users are affected by it. And this is helpful for a team of any size, really, but especially for smaller developers, because you can see where to focus your efforts. You know, I've, got, I've got 188 different crash types in the last month. I can't fix all 188 of those in the next sprint. So I need to kind of focus, OK, the top two or three, we'll see what we can do there. And if you drill into each individual crash, you can see all kinds of nice stuff. How, is it ha how many crashes are happening over time, and the stack trace down here at the bottom even down to the line of code, you know, just like you would see a stack trace in your debugger. This, this time graph is actually pretty helpful because if you maybe had a specific event happen in your app that day, maybe it was just related to that particular event. You don't know just on the stack trace, but maybe something like this gives you a little more context into why the app crashed. We give a lot of diagnostics out of the box. Uh, how much memory was available at the time of the crash, how much disk space. Maybe you were trying to make a write command, like a write to file, and they ran out of disk space, and that caused the crash to an unhandled exception. You know, any diagnostics that we can gather at the time of the crash, we give it to you just for that context to see what actually happened. Things like app version, model number, system version, like I said, everything that we can grab. And actually, when I was working on KeepSafe, uh, this is the system version down here. I put out a release without fully testing it because I'm a terrible developer. But I noticed that we pushed out this release, and about a half an hour later, I get an email from Criticism. And it says, you've got a new crash group. It's happening a lot. You better go check it out. So I open the console, and I see this pie chart is just fully orange. I used an API that was deprecated in iOS 5.1 or something like that. So every user that had iOS 5.1 was getting a crash at the rate of like 10,000 an hour. Me as a developer, that kind of sucked. So I was freaking out. Fortunately, I was able to drill in and see 
okay, it's definitely on 5.1. Was able to figure out the class and the function that was being called. Was able to kind of research it and see, oh crap, I just didn't test it well enough. Able to update it, put out a hotfix in a couple hours. So just that in and of itself, that got me hooked in criticism. This was a couple years ago. Because otherwise I would have gone back and I wouldn't have known about it at all until I went back into the iTunes store and saw all those one star reviews. And it wouldn't even say in those reviews that it was iOS 5. It would just say the app is crashing. So for me as a developer, just knowing that was hugely beneficial. So you never, that's why we give all of this data because you never know what might provide the right context for you to go in and fix the problem. One other thing to mention is we do what we call breadcrumbs. Uh, so they're like a breadcrumb. You, you kind of walk by, you leave it behind you so you know where you're going. A user leaves breadcrumbs throughout their session. So as a developer, this allows you to replicate the issue. You don't just see a stack trace, you see what the user was doing leading up to the stack trace that might have caused it. It allows you to kind of replicate that that environment that they were working in at the time of the crash. And one other thing is you can see the users that were affected by it. And this is, unfortunately this wasn't out at the time that I had my iOS 5.1 crash. But if it was, I would have sent all of those users that were affected an email and said, hey, we apologize for the issue, we're working on a fix, it'll be out in a few hours. This kind of data can all be gathered through our SDK. And it's also available through API too. So you can set up, you can actually set up a system on your side that calls our API, says, give me all the people that have had crashes today, and maybe send them like 20 gold coins in your app or something like that. You can set that up automatically uh, through a nice little trigger or something. And that allows users to kind of feel a little less crappy that the app sucks, right? At least until you can fix the problem. So we dealt with eBay a little while back. They're one of our current customers. They were pretty happy with their crash rate. They said, we're doing pretty well, we're at about 4% crash rate. And we said, well, that kind of sucks actually. That's below average. And how, I mean, how many of you guys know what your crash rate is? Any idea? 100% crash rate? <laughs> Probably want to lower it from there. Number of sessions per day that crash. Number of sessions per what? Sessions per day, or sessions per month, or sessions per whatever. A session is any time the user opens the app to when they close the app. Okay. So their crash rate dropped from 4% to 1%. And you can imagine somebody like eBay, and if they're doing 10 million daily actives, it's probably a conservative number. That's 300,000 <laughs> sessions per day that are active now that weren't before. I mean, in the, when you look at a business perspective, those are big numbers for companies like this. And hopefully they'll be big numbers for you guys as well. So you know, the core of our service is obviously crash reporting, but what happens when a crash isn't the issue? We did a survey a little while back. What do users do about a slowly performing app? So 65% is the top one here. They just uninstalled it. I mean, apps are so commoditized these days that they can just, it's faster for users to uninstall it and download a new one than it is for them to try to bother contacting support or you know, leaving a review or anything like that. So I've been talking this whole time about ratings and getting positive ratings. Those don't mean anything if you can't keep users using your app. So at Criticism, when they looked around to see what can we tackle next after crash reporting, HTTP service monitoring was the next kind of low hanging fruit because so many of app developers' slowness, I guess would be a word for that, ties back into slow services, whether they're your own APIs or third party SDKs the average app connects to about six or seven external APIs. So things like Flurry, things like Google Analytics, Facebook SDK, Twitter SDK, all these different services are all different moving pieces. And you as a developer have no control over how those services are responding. So by plugging in our SDK, you can see all these external services and how they're performing. A useful thing for me, I, I used to work for a company in uh, Japan and we did a lot of business in Asia. And from that, I got to learn that a lot of services weren't allowed in China, one way or another. They were either very, very slow or they would just throw errors all the time. So if you're a developer sitting here in Portland, you might not necessarily know that. So having a service that shows, okay, in each geographic region, these are the slowest performing SDKs. Facebook SDK, if it's absolutely blowing up in China, 
you might want to rip that out and not use Facebook authentication for all your users. You might want to use a local SDK. If you look at how this kind of ties back into monetization, just think about an ad service. You know, you might plug in AdMob and hope for the best, but what if the latency of AdMob is really crappy in certain parts of the world, where a more localized SDK can get you higher fill rates, faster latency, and provide more money in your pocket? You know, those kind of questions are solved just by looking at a dashboard like this. So PayPal, quick story about them. Uh, they noticed that they had an issue one day. And they had a huge segment of revenue that was being lost in a certain region in Argentina. So they were spending all this time, all these resources to figure out, OK, what's going wrong? Is one of our servers down in that area? Is the connection bad? What's going on? They opened up criticism, were able to see down to the city level which cities were having high latency and high error rates. They drilled into it a little farther and found that it was actually a bridge, like a physical bridge that crossed a river that was out somewhere in Argentina. And it was costing them enough money where it showed up on their map. And they were able to determine which cities were affected all just through looking at an SDK like this. So real world examples. Then of course, how can we make even more money? I gotta stop talking here pretty soon. I'm, I ran out of beer a while ago and my throat's getting a little dry, so hopefully I'll wrap it up here shortly. This is our latest service, it's called Transaction Monitoring. So we looked at, okay, we've got crash reporting and we've got HTTP service monitoring. How can we add an extended layer on top of that? So Transaction Monitoring, transaction is kind of a loaded term. Uh, a lot of the times you might associate it with like a shopping cart checkout uh, you could also think about it as like a, like a set of procedures in an old database commit or something like that. But it's anything, think about it as anything that's critical to your application. Uh, I use it for authentication flows, ways to get users to sign up, anything I want to track that's very, very high value. And what you can do with transaction monitoring is actually tie in all kinds of different metrics to each of these flows. So this I have, I have a login flow, a checkout flow, and you can see what the drop-off rates are in each of these flows. So if they're going to check out and they skip out, you can figure out, OK, was this performance related? Was it a crash that happened? Was it a slow HTTP endpoint that occurred? Why did they, why did they back out of my transaction right here? And a very cool thing is that you can tie it directly to revenue risk. So if they've got a shopping cart that's got $140 worth of goods in it and the app crashes, that's potentially $140 that you're not going to see. So these are all very, very important for business decisions, <laughs> uh, even down to the level of what do we focus on as developers. You might see crashes in the checkout flow that are only occurring to 100 different people, but the value is very, very high for those 100 people, where you have another crash that's 10,000 people, but the value is very, very low. So this gives you another set of insights into which crashes should I tackle first? Which performance issues should I really bring to the forefront? And one of the cool, my favorite thing about transaction monitoring is you can drill into every single transaction that takes place. So every time a person has an issue in the checkout flow, you can go in and see every single step that they took. And in, what this looks like in your code, you say transaction start and transaction end. And everything in between will wa we'll watch it like a hawk. So you can see here they switch from LTE to Edge. They call this HTTP endpoint. Here's all the stats on it. They click this. They click that. The internet connection went down, and then it crashed. So you as a developer, you can look back and see, well, it's very clear what happened here. But that's also X dollars that we lost. So we need to figure out, OK, when the internet connection goes down, we need to come up with a user experience that handles that appropriately so the app doesn't crash, and they don't bail on that entire transaction. So it's a very cool feature of, of one of our new services. And one other thing I want to mention is, I, as an app owner, I understand this very, very well, because this is money that's leaving my pocket anytime there's a failed transaction. But think about it, let's say you work for a development shop, or you work for anybody besides yourself. Imagine going to your boss and saying, hey, I fixed these crashes this week. We had $17,000 lost the week before. This week, we only had $3,000 loss. Like, how great is that for you to go into your boss and say, hey, this is what I did by fixing this crash as individual value that you added. So it adds value for every single person along the line from developer all the way up to the app owner. 
and all along, all through the way. I really got to stop talking. Three left. See them at the bottom? We're almost done. So the gist of criticism is we're getting rid of all these bad reviews, these gnarly one stars. Nobody likes to see them. And we're getting all happy, making money critters. <coughs> so that's, that's my spiel. Uh, hope you guys can take away one or two things. Again, I'm here the rest of the night. I'll go hang out at the bar if you guys are down. Uh, but once I head out of town, Mark Filipovich back there, happy to answer any questions you might have about criticism. <laughs>